morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 30th meeting in 2019. Could I ask everyone please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, the committee is asked to consider taking items four and five in private. This is to allow the committee to discuss its output from the session today on the draft islands plan and its approach to the agriculture retained EU law and data Scotland bill. Are members agreed? agreed. We are agreed. So we'll move straight on to agenda item two and that's taking evidence from the Minister for Energy, Connectivity, the Islands and um, on the Scottish Government's proposed National Islands Plan. Could I welcome the panel? Paul Wheelhouse, the Minister for Energy, Connectivity in the Islands. Uh, Erica Clarkson, the Islands Lead. Heather Cowan, the Head of Transport Strategy and European Funding. And Don Morrison, the Island Policy Officer for the Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement, um, just because time is of the essence. Sure, sure Convener. I, I will try and truncate my remarks. Um, thank you very much, Convener and Committee members, for inviting me uh, to give evidence today and for the opportunity to talk about the, the proposed National Islands Plan, uh, which obviously sets out our ambitions for Scotland's islands and islands communities. Um, firstly, if I could just want to acknowledge the support we've received, Convener, from stakeholders, including the Scottish Islands Federation, our partners at University of Strathclyde, and our local authority colleagues. And the proposed plan is, a, is based on a very wide-ranging consultation process, um, which just wouldn't have been possible without their input and support. And I also, if I can take the liberty to thank my own islands team, who've worked extremely hard, you uh, know, being away from home, travelling around 40 islands and doing 61 events in the process of the consultation uh, for their efforts. But the proposed plan um, stems from the Island of Scotland Act 2018. Uh, this is a groundbreaking piece of legislation that Scotland should be proud of. Uh, there are very few countries in the world with a devoted piece of legislation focusing on islands and their communities. In Europe, uh, Croatia has passed a similar act also in 2018, and Finland has a long history of island policy. Uh, however, apart from these, there are very few other examples, not just in Europe, but in the world, and island policy in Scotland is acquiring a global reputation also because of its content, and the whole parliament takes credit for that rather than the government, I, I want to stress. In fact, the proposed plan is a fair, integrated, green and inclusive plan. Those are the th four aspects or four themes which uh, we have focused on in the document, and uh, we believe we're providing leadership across those. The plan is just the, sh the start, and we're now moving towards uh, developing a, an ambitious implementation strategy that will include clear actions and indicators to explain how we will deliver on the commitments present in each of the plan's 13 strategic objectives. As I say, this is only the beginning. Uh, I want to reiterate that in the impl implementation of the plan, we wish to continue to work in an integrated manner. And integration sometimes uh, remains only on paper, and implementation can move back quite quickly, as, as I'm sure we've all seen in our lives, back to sectoral, indeed silo-driven approaches. So we're very keen that this just won't work for islands, and that particular approach wouldn't work for islands and communities. So we want, uh, as the respondents in the consultation identified, uh, to make sure that we develop each strategic objective in line with the four key principles underpinning the plan and make sure that we avoid silo, silo thinking and get uh, departments and agencies and stakeholders to work together to deliver on them. And the plan is devoted to improving outcomes for island communities. However, however while they uh, face challenges, we should also remember, I'm sure we'll focus uh, perhaps some of the negative issues that we need to address, but we should also remember that islands are already great places to live and to visit and to work in. And islands are already, in many aspects, hubs of innovation because necessity, as often as the case, is the mother of invention, Convener. And energy is, of course, a key example where islands and their communities have thrived uh, on renewables, often community renewables, to develop a close and strong alliance with the incredible natural resources that the islands possess. And they can also um, capture the, the, the energy from the wind, the tides, the waves and so forth. But it would not be possible to do that without the hard work and innovation of the islanders themselves. Um, I am conscious of time, uh, Convener, if I can mention just a couple other points I think which are going to be significant in the discussion we're going to have. Firstly, um, just to uh, build on some of the success stories um, that have taken place in our islands and to try and make them even greater places to live for those already there and for people who may want to move there. Um, we are very conscious that depopulation has come through as one of the biggest themes uh, in the document, and I, I'm sure that will be something members are conscious of. We are conscious, though, positively, there are people who want to move to our islands. And just last week, we heard that over 300 people have filed their interest to move to the small island of Ulva in Argyll and Butte, which is tremendously encouraging. 
That would mean a 6,000% increase in population. Um, and uh, while Alva may have been a particular story with a particular romantic kind of uh, notion around trying to rebuild uh, the population there, it does highlight that given the right circumstances, there will be people, whether they are islanders at the moment or not, and uh, non-islanders, who will consider moving to our islands. And the plan, and critically its implementation, will allow us to better understand these circumstances and to develop, hopefully, a sound policy framework to repeat those success factors we've identified elsewhere that have been uh, able to encourage people to move to islands. And in our programme for government, we've committed to publish the final National Islands Plan before the end of this year, and we are on track to do that. And a key focus of the document clearly will be on that, uh, that aspect. And perhaps finally, just because I'm conscious I don't want to overstay my, my welcome this, this point, just tying into uh, young islanders, because I think youth and, and uh, appealing to young people will be critical. I would like to remind the committee, in the programme for government, we also said we'd established a, a new young islanders network, uh, and young people are clearly a very key element uh, for determining the future success of our islands and being able to capture their desires, their dreams, their aspirations is crucial for a successful plan and to deliver a sustainable future for each of our island communities. So with that in mind, Convener, our young people, um, we believe, can be more, very much more than just um, a, a sounding board for their ideas. And young people, as we're seeing it more every day, are now key actors in driving forward change initiative, most obviously in the climate emergency uh, debate and the, the, the work of Greta Thunberg and uh, other young people. And the Young, new, uh, young Islanders Network will not only give young people in islands an outlet for their voice, but very much a place at the heart of the implementation of the plan itself. Uh, and what we mean by that is implementing the, in implementing the plan, we wish young islanders through the network to be a key and active uh, part of the process and stakeholders and to shape the future direction of islands policy and policies that affect our islands. And this will hopefully help us produce a dynamic and forward-looking implementation strategy for the plan. But I, there's much more I could say, but I think I'll end there, Convener, because I know there'll be many issues that com uh, colleagues want to raise. Thank you, thank you, Minister. And I'm sure your team, when they were drawing up the islands plan, loved the opportunity to visit all the islands around Scotland. Who wouldn't? And the first question comes from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I have a couple of themes, and I'm going to ask everything at once uh, to try and help us make uh, progress in the limited time. Um, and, and the first uh, theme does relate to uh, consultation, uh, and I very much welcome what's been said about the uh, Young Islanders Network as an indication of an attempt to bring new people to the discussion. But the, the, the question remains, however, uh, in the 60-plus meetings that you referred to, have we essentially seen the usual suspects in the hall, or have we successfully managed to get individuals who wouldn't engage and uh, uh, interests who might not normally have engaged uh, in, in this? So that's a sort of general question. The other, the other thing that underpinning a lot of what you will do is having appropriate data. And it does seem uh, that uh, there are difficulties uh, that we've heard of in getting island-scale data. There's data at larger areas from councils where it's mainland uh, and, and island, um, and, and just generally the, 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 there's difficulty. Um, so how are you addressing that and what are you aware of? And in relation to data, uh, the plan cross-references the National Performance Framework and UN Sustainable Development Goals in the other direction, not down to the communities, but to wider goals, and how will you assess against that? So that's data. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Stevenson. I think you, you raise um, some very important points, and it is, it's helpful, I think, to just focus on the range of people that are involved. We have tried to avoid the, the, the trap of, of just talking to usual suspects, and that's why um, the team um, uh, led by Eric and Don have, have really pushed uh, as far as they could in terms of uh, reaching as many islands as possible and as many islanders. So th through the online consultation and the 61 public events and meetings that we held across the, the 40, 40 islands, I appreciate that's not anywhere near the total, 96 inhabited islands, uh, and we've got a job to do to try and make sure we're picking up messages from the remaining islands that we weren't able to visit in the consultation. But we reached, did reach over uh, or, or almost 1,000 individuals in that process, which uh, I'm sure members um, who, are, who are experienced will know that that's a pretty extensive number of, of consultees to have in, uh, compared with most government consultations which attract perhaps lower, lower uh, feedback. Um, but in the live events that were backed up by the online consultation, we received a total of 414 responses from 356 individuals and 58 organisations. And we understand, um, and, and I 
stand ready to be corrected by colleagues, but I think 99% of the individuals who responded to the consultation indicated that they uh, already live or are related to, uh, uh, have a, a related um, link to an island. And geographically, respondents covered all of the relevant local six local authorities that are covered by the Islands Act. So I'm pleased that we've got a good range, um, both geographically um, and in terms of the, the, the makeup of, of those that were there, um, I suppose the one area uh, that we're conscious of, we need to do more in, in terms of actual Allen's plan itself, which may reflect the feedback in the consultation, is to be uh, to do more work around around gender, um, uh, but gender issues, which uh, I know are, are, are an issue we will maybe um, uh, want to focus on as we go forward. Um, but the. A uh, detailed report for, for each island's uh, uh, consultation is also available. So although we're talking today about the National Island Plan, for each of the areas we visited, a report was prepared for each of those islands. So you'll be able to get a flavour for the diversity of issues raised and um, those communities that we consulted who perhaps will look at the National Islands Plan and say, well, there's not a specific mention of the issue I raised at my session. We have captured all of that. And I think that will be tremendously helpful as well. And I think there will be some granularity in the feedback from different groups within society um, at a very local level that might not be reflected in, in the National Island Plan as, itself. But on the data point, I think that is a very important issue. Even looking through my briefing, um, which uh, the, the team, team have produced assiduously, as, as always, um, there are various data indicators where we've only got data for the island authorities the three island authorities, but it's more difficult to break out the island data in the other three authorities in terms of North Ayrshire, Highland uh, and Argyll and Butte. And clearly we know that, ironically, Island, uh, Argyll and Butte has more islands and inhabited islands than any other local authority, I think, in terms of... So there are, uh, you know, some challenges there to make sure we've got the range of indicators that, uh, that we need. The plan does... Rec uh, you agree there's an issue? I do agree, yes. What are we doing? Well, the, the, I'll, I'll happily come to that, Convener. The, the right. plan recognises that um, better local data is going to be key to understanding the nature of the challenges and how then shape, we can shape our response to those challenges, both in terms of demographics, economic uh, development uh, data, you know, health data, other areas that we, we need to focus on, housing information uh, as another example. And uh, this is going to be important in, in addressing the effectiveness of policy measures and identifying the indicators we then use for the implementation plan as well, because we, you know, we obviously need to be able to measure progress. And there's a lack of robust disaggregated socioeconomic data at the island level, particularly publishable data. Uh, so one of the key areas of feedback was received throughout the consultation was that in certain areas there are significant gaps in available data and we now must spend time on gathering and analysing this data to ensure that any measurable outcomes present in the plan supporting implementation strategy are informed from a reliable baseline. Uh, so we lack the baseline, so we need to establish that and then obviously monitor progress there forwards. And research is being undertaken by Scotland's Rural University College, SRUC, uh, to formally identify those gaps in relation to island data across all levels and will continue as a key component of the implementation strategy itself. So we hope to, as a positive byproduct of this process, to improve the granularity and accessibility of data as it uh, affects the islands. And we will also re review the availability and usefulness uh, of a wider barriers to island uh, level data, both at an individual island level, uh, groups of islands, and consider the creation of a Scottish islands data level in order to better uh, understand the challenges faced by island communities. And that feeds into the NPF point that I think the, the member raised uh, regarding um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, as well and uh, the development of indicators uh, to measure the extent to which outcomes for island communities identified in the plan are improved um, will uh, also be provided, um, our bill building on outcomes and indicators provided for the national performance framework and also on good practice stemming from the development of the indicators for the sustainable development goals at a global level. So there are statutory provisions in the Island Scotland Act to provide for annual reports and progress um, by, by Scottish Ministers and review every five years and these will uh, focus on assessing whether the plan has made pro positive progress in areas such as this. Very short question, because I think which, you can which, answer which it in I one may, sentence. may get a, a quite short answer. Well, I was going to say, I think one sentence can answer it. Uh, you did mention in your opening remarks um, a interest from people who are not on islands in repopulating. And I just wonder what contact, if any, you have made or plan to make on that group of people who are relevant to this. 
I will maybe make this very short, convener, and that I, I can direct my colleague Eric Clarkson perhaps to, to, to answer that. And we tried to capture that in the consultation. We specifically modified the questionnaire to try and appeal to uh, people who are no longer islanders, perhaps people who have left the islands for economic reasons, to try and see whether there are any factors that could attract them back. Um, but uh, perhaps, uh, if with your permission, convener, I can ask Erica just to see how we'll keep in touch with any individuals that fed back on that. Erica. Erica. Does it just do it itself? Thank you. It all <laughs> happens automatically. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, as Mr. Wilhouse says, uh, we did our very best to reach out to uh, people who have moved away from the, the islands or have an association with islands but no longer live on them. Um, and um, we did that through the usual channels of social media and traditional media. And we did have a number of respondents to the online consultation um, from people who, who have an interest but no longer live. So we're doing our very best to reach out to them um, and to maintain contact with them. And I hope that through our Young Islanders Network also, we might be able to encourage young people to consider returning to the islands. Jamie, you briefly wanted a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, this was about consideration of the plan itself. Um, admittedly, we, we did pass the Act, which said that there would be 40 days from uh, presenting uh, the plan to Parliament. Um, but this committee issued a call for evidence, but only for three weeks, and we only had 44 responses. Do you think, in retrospect, if we were to do the, the bill again, we might have given a bit more time for stakeholders to consider the plan? Um, I, I, I don't want to criticise anything that went before, uh, Convener, but certainly it has been a real time pressure on us to, to get through the process, and obviously, clearly, more time would, would be helpful. We are, we're not rushing this because we want to rush it. We, we obviously want to get it right. And so, um, uh, clearly, we're trying to use the current period to, to get as much information as we can. But I do appreciate the difficulty that creates for the committee as well as uh, my colleagues in government. And uh, with retrospect, it, it would be helpful to have more time. And perhaps we can reflect on that for future iterations of the National Islands Plan. Um, but, but certainly, we're, we're making the best of trying to honour the, the, the commitments given in the Act and, at, at present. And that does, unfortunately, constrain us to that 40-day period. Thank you, Minister. Uh, John Finney, John. Thank you, Governor. Hey, good morning, Minister. Good morning, panel. Uh, Minister, the proposed plan, uh, we're still in the consultation and development of the plan. The <coughs> Excuse me, the proposed plan wasn't published in Gaelic. Now, Mishnik, uh, an organisation for which I have some regard for, um, said it's disappointing and shameful. Hagajeraf, uh, I agree, it's not good. Why, why is that the case? Um, well, I certainly, I, I you know, want to certainly apologise if there's any impression given that we're in any way disrespecting the, the language. I, I, I very much believe Gaelic has a very strong role to, to play in Scottish society today and hopefully a stronger one in future. If, if we get our policies right, then hopefully we can, particularly around avoiding depopulation in areas such as the Western Isles, we can hopefully see, and Sky indeed, um, you know, where there's obviously strong strength in the language. We want to, to ensure the language has a bright future. But the, the time scales, and it touches on a very similar point to, to the point Mr Green made, um, uh, and this is not a criticism of, of any colleagues that, that uh, put these measures forward, um, but the, the, the tight time scales imposed by the Act unfortunately meant, and probably because it's got ministerial changes to, to, to go through as well, which um, in terms of we're editing and, and, and colleagues are uh, across the, the policy officials, different departments are editing their objectives and their, uh, their, their actions in the plan and making sure they got everything right, that it, w it wasn't possible to complete a Gaelic version of the proposed National Islands Plan in the timescale we had available. And I do apologise for that. In an ideal world, we'd love to have had a parallel version, a Gaelic language version and uh, an English medium version at the same time. So the final published version of the National Islands Plan will be available in Gaelic and, and English and any other language as requested. And uh, the proposed plan that was laid before the Parliament on the 3rd of October is in English, but uh, we made the objectives and the commitments available in Gaelic. And I want to stress also that we will extend an invitation to the board, the board of Gaelic to uh, join our new National Islands Plan Governance Group to ensure that the uh, plan aligns as close as possible to the National Gaelic Plan uh, and make sure we, we try and uh, pick up, uh, if we have lost any ground on this, we want to try and pick up as much ground as we can and, and we're really glad that the, the Boris and the Gaelic will, will take part. Okay, I, I don't wish to labour a negative, but of course people will look to government to provide that leadership and, you know, um, everyone can find a reason not to do something. It doesn't the equal respect to agenda. I very much acknowledge that, Mr Finney, and I apologise for the position that we are, we're in there, but we, we hope to try and make sure that we've got a, a fully uh, accurate Gaelic version for the final plan. Okay, if, if I maybe just continue with, with a couple of points on that, um, Minister, and that is, 
we've received evidence that the plan is, and I quote here, soft and weak, and this is because of the use of terms like encourage and consider, um, particularly as there's a statutory system operating already. What will you do to strengthen the plan in this regard and make sure it aligns more closely with the National Gaelic Plan, which itself is written in a non-island context, and indeed the role of Borshna Gaelic? Um, well, certainly, uh, respondents, we recognise the response to the consultation uh, that stressed that the investment in Gaelic language and culture has brought positive results uh, to our islands. That's, that's, that's something we can hang on to as positive. I recognise that um, you know, stakeholders who, who may believe that there's, uh, if there are weaknesses in the, in the document, we're obviously keen to address those, and, and I hope that the participation in the Borsna Gaelic will, will help strengthen if, if there needs to be strengthening in areas of the National Island Plan and certainly in implementation that we make sure we've got, as I say, as close as possible alignment with the, the National uh, Gaelic Plan and uh, that we need to take a solid approach to include many aspects of the culture of different island communities, including la local languages and not just Gaelic, of course. Um, so I recognise the diversity of our islands and that you know, Gaelic isn't the dominant language in, in all our islands, but we need to reflect the, the aspirations of those communities for their own, uh, their own use of language. Uh, conscious of the Northern Isles, for example, there may be a different, a different uh, view. But we very much want to build links with the, 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 the board and, and, and make sure that we take on board their feedback and indeed those of other stakeholders who have interest in other languages. Uh, and if we can strengthen there, we welcome uh, the input from the committee if there are recommendations, what you feel we should do to, to address that. Okay, more in time. Thank you. Uh, I think you want to push a bit more on that. Thanks, <coughs> when the, <coughs> excuse me, when the uh, Islands Act, as, um, as it is, went through the committee, we were told that, you know, we, laid, we raised a lot of issues about detail, <coughs> health services, transport, and all sorts of things. And we were told then, don't worry about that, because the Act is an enabling act, and all of this detail will be in the, in the plan. Now, plans, as far as I'm aware, and most people are aware, should be smart. That is, specific, measurable achievable, relevant, and time-limited. So plans should be smart and specific and all of these things. When I look down what is in this plan, and this is where the confusion comes in, it says, we will, just to take one of them, we will work with Highlands and Islands, we will work with stakeholders, we'll collaborate with, we'll work in partnership, we'll work with HIE, we'll showcase leadership, we'll promote we'll create, we'll ensure, we'll build on, we'll ensure that, we'll work, I could go on, I mean, it says, we'll ensure that crofting, we'll take forward the delivery, we'll work together, we'll seek to expand, we'll review. Goodness me, none of this is smart. There are no smart measures here. There's, I mean, I could understand it if this was a strategic look forward and then we'll get the plan with all these specific measures. But I think what you're doing, if I may say so, and I'd like very much like you to respond to this, is confusing everybody because I can, as I say, well understand if you have a strategic approach. To me, that's what this is. This is not a plan. Any comment? Well, I mean, I, I think I'd go back to a couple of points I made in my opening remarks. First of all, this is, this is the first time we've ever done this. So we're, we're not expecting we're going to get this... Uh, bang on, we'd love to have got a perfect result um, first time first time round, but there are relatively few countries that have, have done this in the world, so this is this is new territory for, for the Scottish Parliament, it's new territory for the Scottish Government and for our stakeholders. The, 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 the Islands Scotland Act requires that we prepare a national islands plan, uh, the, so quite specifically. The purpose of which was, and I, I, was to set out our main objectives and strategy in relation to improving outcomes for island communities. So I take your point about smart objectives. So I, I very much, you know, uh, would hope we can, we will, we will uh, get to that that point. But the plan provides us. Are there any in here that are smart? Well, we've set out, as you know, that um, uh, a number of objectives and uh, over 100 actions that fall, flow from those objectives. Uh, uh, and what we will be doing through the development of the um, implementation uh, strategy 
uh, is develop uh, on that in terms of the indicators to measure progress. That will get us to a point where we've got smart objectives. At the moment, as we just discussed with colleagues, in some cases the data doesn't exist or it's not published at an island's level, so we need to fill the gaps, and that's what Strucker are doing to help us to identify that, build a good uh, framework in terms of the quality of data we need to provide the right indicators to then measure progress against these, these objectives. So we very much share Mr Rumble's aspiration to, to have smart um, objectives and targets uh, to, to implement our actions, so I, I very much respect the point he's making. But the, the plan provides us with a framework and a direction to take, and we've already started work to shape the implementation strategy, which has been co-created with island communities and stakeholders, which I hope the, the committee will welcome, and which will also set out specific actions and timescales uh, to meet the point Mr Rumble says for each of the commitments within the plan. Uh, and its success, of course, depends on the way in which it's implemented, the plan itself. So it's important that this implementation strategy fully addresses in detail each of the 13 strategic objectives listed in the plan. It will look closely at every factor in relation to each objective and set out the steps we'll take to deliver on our commitments. And there's a whole chapter, of course, in the, uh, in the proposed plan setting out our commitments to support effective imp implementation. And we hope that by working closely um, with our local authority colleagues and other island partners, that will address any confusion that, that may have arisen around the purpose of the implementation strategy itself. So I, I appreciate the from what Mr Rumbles is saying that he may feel that we've not done enough at that point, but we are very clearly committing to develop the, the framework I think he's yearning for uh, to be able to measure progress against the objectives. And I hope we will, in, in short order, get to that point. I understand what you're saying, Minister. I'm pleased with what you're saying, actually, but, but I just think that if we got this right, I mean, if we if we talked about this as a strategy, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this as a strategy, but it, it, what it isn't is a plan. And I just think it's, it's, a, it's a wish, really, to avoid confusing constituents, confusing the inhabitants of our islands who, who, who are really looking, looking to this to say, because if I were an islander, and I'm not, but if I were an islander and I picked this up thinking this is the plan, my basic question is, what are you going to do, actually do, and when are you going to do it? So when I pick this up, I think, gosh, this is a strategy. So I think we should call things what they are. This is a good strategy. I have a, I have a plea. When you come, and I know that you're talking about, you're now talking, so I think adds to confusion, about an implementation strategy. What we should have is the plan at that point. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? I, I very much do, um, I, and I have great sympathy with a lot of what you're saying, Mr Rumbles. I hope I'm not giving an alternative impression. Um, but we, we also have a challenge, I think, and, and I hope um, this might make you know, deal with some of the confusion. Uh, we obviously are wanting to set up a kind of uh, a partnership approach with local authorities, as say, and other key stakeholders now, and obviously the work with the young, young people and the Young Islanders Network as well. Um, and we need to obviously identify um, not just the, the metrics of how we will measure progress, but also who's going to lead on particular themes. And, and we want to do that very much in partnership with consultation with local authorities and other, uh, other partners. So I hope we will get there through consensus as to identifying the importance of all, the, of, the, of all of these objectives and the actions within them are, are, are recognised by, by all parties, I'm sure, uh, but get to a point where we can identify who's leading on this. And some of the actions may involve um, uh, UK uh, agencies and UK government, of course, we want to work with them to, to try and make sure we take on board uh, their potential to contribute to the delivery of the island's plan. But clearly, a lot of the areas of action will be uh, at our own uh, uh, our, own, uh, our own decisions can, can influence those. So we want to work with local authorities, our, our, our agencies, our, ourselves, of course, to make sure we identify how we can take them forward. And I hope we will get there. Now, in future, it may well be that we, Parliament decides to, to, to switch things around and you have an, uh, a, a national island strategy and a, a plan. But the legislation is framed in such a way as we have to deliver a plan. I appreciate it may look a bit like a strategy <laughs> and uh, I very much take the member's point. Uh, it's quite high level at this point, but we want to get down to the granularity and hopefully we'll get, be in a better place with indicators and data that will inform future iterations of the plan. Emma, do you want to push just briefly on, uh, I guess, on targets you, and times and things? No, I, actually, you've clarified, uh, Minister, thank you for the difference between strategies and plans. And, you know, whatever we do, we, do, we need to get on with it and people need to understand. So um, I take Mr Rumble's point about the plans versus strategies. But uh, I think it is clear that there is going to be a wee bit of confusion and it just needs some clarity. We, we, I certainly commit we'll do what we can to 
to clarify that and not add to confusion. That's not my aim this morning. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Richard, uh, Rich Lyle. Uh, to carry on, I think, uh, that question. One council has stated there are over 100 commitments in the plan and a lot of work will be required to turn these into tangible, measurable actions. What the partnership stated with regard to practicality of delivery, the plan has far too many proposed actions in it to be able to achieve even a small proportion. So we know that local authorities in COSLA have expressed concerns about the feasibility, the volume of commitments and also the lack of targets and the outcomes in the plan. So how do you intend to address that? Uh, well, certainly I, I recognise the danger and that, 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 the, that uh, Mr Lyle is alluding to in terms of the um, deliverability when you've got a huge number of objectives and um, we've obviously just dealt with a con confusion issue. Um, one action from the island strategic group meeting in August uh, that's uh, currently being taken forward by, by Erica and the team is the establishment of a new partnership group for uh, of, of Scottish Government and local authority officials. And we hope that this group, um, which will hopefully help with the point that Mr Rumbles has made as well, will be fully involved in the development of the implementation strategy and the associated measurable outcomes. And one key aspect of the implementation strategy itself will be the development of, of the indicators, touching on the points that we made earlier on uh, by Mr Stevenson, and having fully considered suitable options for, for those indicators that, that we can actually use to, to measure progress, um, we feel it will then be appropriate for, to use indicators developed on the basis of national performer and the sustainable development goals as a means to demonstrate progress for each of the 13 objectives. And uh, they are being developed for each outcome and objective in collaboration with key delivery partners. And hopefully that will give us a bit more clarity um, about the nature of the outcomes that are being sought and um, uh, you know, if there are any concerns that local authority partners have about um, the feasibility, the volume of commitments, or the, the uh, to pick on Mr Rumble's point, the lack of targets or, or um, objectives and outcomes in the, uh, specified in the plan itself, that will hopefully help um, begin to clear a bit of the mist away, the fog away, and there'll be a clarity and we obviously bear down on those that we feel are most uh, urgently uh, requiring action. Um, we'll have to, uh, to some extent, uh, prioritise, I think, in terms of the sort of 80-20 principle and, uh, to some degree, but there will obviously be issues that uh, we want to, to pick up across all of the objectives. And um, I hope you know, we can get through the partnership group that um, is being established to the point where local authorities are comfortable with what's, what's in the plan and the implementation uh, strategy and uh, they get the clarity that they, they clearly are expressing to you in the committee that they feel they need. Having previously been the SNP group leader in COSLA, I know the way that COSLA works and I know how councils continually say to government, uh, we need more money. So, have you costed the pro proposals in the plan? What assessments has the plan been through? And also, for brevity, how will the Scottish Government structure civil service support to ensure delivery of the plan? And how will you deliver on the aspirations to align different Scottish Government plans and strategies and also help councils to deliver the plan. Thank you very much for, for running those together. I'm, I'm conscious there's a lot of questions that are being wanted to be asked. Um, so, Minister, I, I'm I'll, going to I'll try and encourage fair. you, if I may, uh, towards brevity, so yeah. every committee member gets a chance to answer their question. Absolutely. But, Please go ahead and answer. Uh, the absolutely, and, and if there's anything in, in, in shortening my answers, if there's anything that committee feels subsequently you want more detail, and obviously try and provide that, convener. Um, I, th I think you've raised very important points. Obviously, we are we are we are we are feeding into the spending review process what we believe uh, is required to ensure implementation of the, the plan, and 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 that's why we're needing to develop a sort of prioritised and fully costed implementation strategy um, uh, to, to to labour that point and to identify a leadership for each of the the objectives and actions within it. Um, and so my, my colleagues, um, officials are, are working to ensure the final version of the National Islands Plan is equality assessed. And uh, in the meantime, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, those kind of issues to ensure that we are feeding through into the budget process, that we've done the appropriate checks, um, not just in terms of island proofing, but the appropriate uh, aspects of sort of equalities that may come, come back to uh, be scrutinized as part of the budget process. 
In terms of the point around the civil service um, that, that um, Mr Lyle raises, it's a sim similar point, I guess. We, we obviously do have a dedicated island team uh, led by islanders, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, so er Eric and Don and, and colleagues are in, in the islands team are, are islanders themselves, and I think that's very important. Um, but the plan itself uh, aligns itself and ongoing policy developments um, and it was uh, it was created with input from across government. So uh, you know we we want to ensure that we continue that kind of cross portfolio working as well. So we have put some asks in to the process to make sure we beef up the team in the areas we believe is necessary. But we'll also be drawing upon as we've obviously got colleagues such as Heather here today who've got very strong interest in in. Uh, specific areas of policy such as transport that have an impact on implementation uh, of the plan and so we'll continue to work across portfolio but we want to build the uh, core team if you like the islands team to, to to make sure we've got sufficient resource there uh, to deliver on the strategy uh, implementation strategy convener thank you um, sorry can i just push you just a wee bit on that minister i mean the the, the plan comes up with with a list of objectives that you want to achieve you must have an idea of what it's going to cost you I mean, do you have a figure that you've got in your mind that you're going to be asking for in the budget to the implementation of the island plan? We, we, we I do. guess I would have done. <laughs> there are some areas where we've got more clarity than others at the moment. So uh, to, to pick up the point earlier on, Convener, it's not to evade the answer. Um, it, it's, it's because there are areas where we don't yet know, have, have sufficient baseline information to know to, how far we have to go, how, how far we have to travel on, on the particular indicators. And obviously, for the three island authorities, it's easier to gauge. Uh, where we're going and clearly there's there's a whole discussion about islands deal as well so there's some asks that are being framed around around that so we have some clarity in some areas and we're happy to uh, write to the committee with where we do have clarity but there are other areas where we believe there there is more work needing to be done through the, the uh, program group uh, it was for partnership group i was referring to to identify the scale for of clarity you haven't got a definitive cost for this and you haven't been and asked for that money to be set aside in the budget when it finally comes out not, not in the format I think you're looking for, convener, um, because they're, they're obviously across entire government portfolio uh, or portfolios. There's, there's a huge range of actions, over 100 actions. So we've not got to a precise figure yet to answer your question. But what we obviously do with working with the uh, approach we've outlined with the uh, partnership group um, that has been established with uh, the lead of, uh, officials from local authorities and Scottish Government, we're going to bear down on that, identifying the scale of uh, investment needed uh, in, to tackle some of the indicators. So that will come later, the cost? That should come later through the implementation strategy process, yeah. Um, Jamie, you wanted to follow up. Uh, thank you. It's just to follow on that theme. I mean, one of the biggest fears when uh, we started looking at the uh, Islands bill in the first place was this uh, notion that it would be lots of warm words but not be followed up with um, meaningful resource, including financial resource. The financial memorandum was very light in that respect, I recall. And I've gone through the plan, and there are only a couple of mentions of money, but there are sums of money which we're already aware of. So, house building, digital, uh, uh, 4G infill, and so on. So, these are numbers which are Scotland wide, not specific to islands and there are numbers which are already out there in the ether. Um, so my question is, is, is uh, this plan is a proposed plan, it's a draft plan. When we get to the final iteration of it, will islanders expect to see something tangible and meaty in terms of financial resource going behind it? Otherwise, we just have a long wish list of things that, uh, that, that government wants to see, but nothing uh, put behind it to make it happen. Well, um, I, I think that, that is an important question to raise. Uh, what I would say is to give committee confidence, indeed wider parliament confidence, clearly we, we have committed, uh, are committed to, through the, the Islands Act itself, uh, updates to parliament annually once the National Islands Plan is, is developed and finalised, which we'd hope to be uh, relatively quickly. Um, I, we're required to do, to do so. Um, but then I will be held to account, government will be held to account and progress against the, the National Islands Plan. So it's in our interest, actually, to start um, identifying through the implementation strategy process the partnership group that I've talked about uh, to identify the indicators that allow us to measure progress and show that we're making progress 
and to have funding flow from that to, to actually, where we've got weakness in terms of delivery against the national plan, to make sure resource goes to, to those areas where it's most needed. So I think um, Parliament can take confidence from its own capability to scrutinise government in areas such as climate change. We've seen similar, uh, and indeed the National Gaelic Plan, we've seen similar kind of pressure from, from Parliament across the chamber to see progress. And that will, I think, mean that flood funds will flow through to address where there are, are vulnerabilities. Clearly, we've also got the Islands deal we're involving both the UK government and the Scottish government at the moment, discussing with the island authorities, the three um, uh, uh, island, island councils, um, progress in those respects. We've got the Argyll and Butte deal already under underway, and of course the, the Inverness and sit, uh, Inverness City Region deal has already been uh, put through. So, so there are areas where you're quite right to identify in housing, where there are some specific islands funds in uh, R100 and uh, 4G Info programmes are good examples where taking an outside an approach so it would be possible to get to a place where we can see what kind of resources being uh, delivered in, in our islands. Uh, we're not at that point yet, uh, which I think the convener was probing about, but we hope to get there so we've got more clarity about investment that is going in to support the islands. Bring in Angus, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I do kind of keep pushing people short questions, short answers yeah. are perfect. Sorry, okay. Angus. Yeah, okay, thanks, Convener. Just while we're discussing resources, uh, exactly where are the negotiations regarding um, UK government funding for the islands deal? Uh, well, that, that's um, a very important uh, issue that Mr. MacDonald raises. The um, negotiations are going, as members may be aware, uh, obviously we've got to. Uh, Purda now because of the UK general election um, and, and so uh, understandably there's, there's probably going to be little progress made at this point in time. Um, we are uh, certainly working uh, to try and support the island authorities get to a position where they have clarity about funding. The, uh, what I can say to keep it brief, convener, is um, UK government support for an island deal was announced on the 28th of July. Um, with the announcement that it would invest um, £300 million of growth deal funding in the remaining deals, that's uh, one in Northern Ireland, one in Wales and three in Scotland, uh, the UK Government has now committed uh, 243 million of that 300 million to the deals in Northern Ireland, um, which is 163 million in Wales, 55 million at Argyll and Butte, 25 million, leaving 57 million for the remaining deals in Falkirk and in, in the islands. And it's unclear on how this money will then be split at this point um, or if the funding will meet the ambitions of the islands. But my colleague Michael Matheson, who leads on this issue, has, been, has written to the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, pressing uh, for clarity from the UK Government. Now, clearly that may not happen until after the uh, UK election, of course, um, but we are seeking to uh, get clarity there. The, the islands are, islands councils are finessing their proposals. They have uh, expected to provide, I think, um, uh, finalised proposals uh, to uh, both governments uh, at some point this month. Um, and uh, we've got some idea of, of sort of draft areas that they are looking at, which I appreciate may not be able to go through today, convener. But um, so it, we're getting to a point where I think there's clarity about the islands' ass are. And we obviously have to await the outcome of the UK general election to see what progress can be made on, on funding. Uh, but it does look like the envelope has, has, has now shrunk to quite a small small level from a UK government perspective. And clearly, uh, Mr. Mathens is keen to, to get a, a kind of envelope to work with to see what uh, Scottish government then needs to provide. Emma, you'd like to yes. go next. Thank you, Convener. And I'll put uh, my questions together as well in order to, to be a bit more uh, succinct. It's, I'm looking at the decentralisation of power and island-specific planning. And the Highland Council stated that local authorities are singled out as being critical to implementation while being al almost inv invisible as partners in most of the strategic objectives. It's interesting that they're using that word, in invisible partners. But in, when I'm going through the, the plan, the local authorities are mentioned about 37 times in the 70 pages and community planning is also a uh, key to the local development as well so I, I guess both my questions are around how will you ensure that uh, the local authorities and community planning partnerships will be engaged with in order to implement the plan and um, because I'm sure it's critical that everybody is involved and all the stakeholders are engaged with um, especially if they're using the words invisible in, in the, the language as opposed to, you know, engagement. And the, the other question would be, how do we ensure that best practice is shared easily between the islands as well? Because we know that there are some islands that are doing great as far as uh, population um, improvements. So. Well, I think, I think those are 
uh, very, very pertinent points. I mean, certainly the, the invisibility point. I, I'm sorry if, if, if uh, to hear that. Um, you know, if local, any local authority partners feel that they're invisible in the plan, they, they have been very important to us in the development of the plan, and they will be even more important now than, than ever in terms of implementation, developing implementation strategy through the partnership group and the uh, desire we have to make sure that we um, identify those actions that we can work on together and, 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 and uh, uh, very keen indeed that local authorities feel that they've got a uh, full input to that. So I, I would hope um, when we come to the point of the finalised plan that, uh, that local authority colleagues who are really important partners to us, I can stress that uh, uh, more importantly today, um, that they feel valued and that they feel that they are very much at the heart of this. Uh, it is very much about them and their, their communities. And so uh, we want them to feel very much at the heart of it. In terms of best practice, I think that's, that's a, a very constructive point, because I, I know uh, Ms Harper is absolutely right. There are some really good examples of our communities uh, in, in all the different archipelagos have, have made real progress, but they can be juxtaposed with islands that are next door that are having real, real challenges. So we do need to learn the lessons, as I was alluding to earlier on, about how there have been successful cases of, of building population. And that could be perhaps um, something that just happens naturally off the back of investment in infrastructure. It could be something that happens for specific efforts targeted at um, uh, groups such as young people or educational opportunities or, or indeed health improvements. Uh, we need to understand what were the critical success factors where we've seen a positive turnaround in a community. And that's a, a, an aspect of the work which has been uh, taken forward under the migration work that, that, that uh, Ms Hislop is leading on as the uh, Cabinet Secretary for External Affairs uh, and um, Culture and leading on sort of migration issues across portfolio team of ministers trying to understand uh, for not just island communities, but other communities in the mainland as well, where we've seen depopulation, how do we actually turn things around? And I think there could be some really good um, lessons learned from some of our island communities who, perhaps because they've had to, have been more innovative uh, than some of the neighbouring communities on the mainland and have then managed to come up with real success stories about how they've rebuilt their future. So, as I said in my opening remarks, great success in, in maybe areas like energy. It was community energy projects have provided funds to reinvest in community infrastructure, attract people back to the islands, um, and uh, in areas such as cultural industries where there's been a real rebirth of culture in some communities, which has led to tourism growth. So I think I think there, we, we very much do need to do what Ms Harper is, is, is indicating. I'm grateful for her question. We'll make sure we try and focus on doing exactly that. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, Jamie Green. Jamie, I think you've got the next uh, question. Thank you. It does follow on, actually. Um, uh, clearly, there are, there are two distinct groups of islands, those who sit in unitary island authorities and those which uh, sit in uh, local authorities uh, with a uh, mainland presence as well. Um, but nonetheless, living on an island is living on an island, whether you're 15 minutes away from land or 15 hours. So I guess my question is, uh, how does the government... Uh, take cognizance of that fact that the local authorities that have been tasked with delivering these 100 plus uh, objectives, um, or, or many of them indeed, um, will be able to deliver them within the confines of a budget which also has to look after uh, substantial uh, mainland populations as well? I think um, that, that's a very uh, clear point. I think uh, the member has made a very cogent point that we obviously have to take account of the diversity of our island communities and he is quite right to identify that the contexts differ for some of our islands so some do have feel they've got perhaps a, a, a stronger voice in how their local authorities run because the entire local authority is geared around islands communities and, and perhaps there's uh, you know access to, to funding on a different basis to you know weighted to uh, to, to the kind of proportion of the population that are, that are islanders in those authorities, whereas others perhaps, uh, and, and this is not a criticism of the local authorities themselves, perhaps just uh, through, for historic reasons feel they have to fight a bit harder to be heard. Uh, we do have some very small island communities, of course, um, and, and even in the context of some of our island archipelagos themselves, uh, I'm so sure members will know there are sometimes criticisms that um, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, decisions being taken in one island uh, but perhaps less uh, cognition of, of, of the problems in, in other islands within within those areas. So it, it is important that we uh, focus on that. As to the, the issues around funding, obviously uh, we are we are keen, as I've, I've, I've talked of, to, to try and identify um, where things are, are 
going well, uh, which picks up uh, Emma Harper's point, but also clearly where things are not working so well. And if there are challenges in, in some of these communities that are affected because of this, the governance structures and and the, uh, the, the, the context in which they, they live, that they're not doing quite as well to attract resource or, or investment, then we need to learn lessons from that. And that may well then govern how government and, uh, and our local authority partners then uh, support them. Now, I, I do appreciate that the financial climate is very difficult for all local authorities, indeed the Scottish Government, indeed public sector across the whole of the UK is, is challenged at this moment in time, and we're no, we're no different in that respect. But we need to, to help identify with our partners at local government level how to prioritise investment. So if there are limited funds, where can we make the biggest impact? Where can we really start to, uh, to make an impact and then get, gather momentum? Hopefully that will feed through into more resource that then we can recycle back into to investing further. So um, as with any form of public expenditure, we need to ensure we're using every pound as a effectively as possible and uh, this is no different but we'll want to use that partnership group to help extract the kind of um, the intellectual kind of uh, power of, of, of our local authorities themselves to tell us where can we actually make most impact here. Angus, <coughs> you've got some questions I think. Yes, uh, thanks um, convener. Um, in their submission, uh, Corin and Yellen share are concerned about the lack of reference to Brexit planning. Um, and to, to quote them, they said, the plan makes no reference to future regional policy post-Brexit. Islands have benefited, benefited significantly from EU funding in the past. It is critical that future regional policy reflects an impact on island challenges and priorities and is adequately resourced to do so. So how does the plan align with wider planning for EU exit, if it happens? Uh, and does the, the plan have sufficient reference to uh, expected post-Brexit issues? Um, well, it's one of the things I was going to refer to, but I obviously constrain my opening remarks. I think Brexit has a huge bearing on, um, on, the, island, on the island's future. Uh, I think principally, uh, but not exclusively, obviously, in areas of population, retention, uh, growth, if possible, and, and economic development. So clearly there's some sectors where islands are particularly prevalent in terms of uh, um, their impact on, on, on Scotland's, uh, Scotland's overall sectoral health, such as aquaculture, um, tourism, um, food and drink. These are areas that we know will be potentially affected by, by Brexit, depending on the severity of the, the Brexit deal itself in terms of its impact on the economy. And so therefore, um, you know, we, we obviously want to make sure we reflect on that. And if uh, authorities such as the Corla are, are saying they don't feel it's sufficiently reflected, that's something we've got the ability to reflect on for the, the, the final version of the plan. But in the proposed plan, uh, strategic objective one includes the need to understand the impact of Brexit islands um, and the island communities. And we will make this a priority as we move into the implementation phase. Uh, the plan itself is being developed in the context of the uncertainties around Brexit. None of us in this room, I suspect, know exactly how it's going to pan out. And indeed, I still hope, as I think Mr Macdonald does, it doesn't happen at all. But, you know, we, we'll see what happens. And there's a growing body of evidence which suggests there could be, as I say, potentially damaging impacts on rural and island communities. So we know it poses a particular uh, risk to our rural areas in some respects, such as, um, uh, as I say, uh, the ability to retain those very valued EU citizens who've, who've made their home in Scotland, paid us the ultimate compliment of, of choosing Scotland to be their home. And um, it does cast a shadow of uncertainty on the application of the EU cohesion policy to Scotland. Um, EU funding, of course, which has been particularly important in developing the island's economies um, and uh, for key facilities and infrastructure for communities uh, is also an area of uncertainty. So we, we await details of how um, the Shared Prosperities Fund, as it's been called, will be um, will be delivered in Scotland, and and indeed what implications there may be for that in replacing European Social Fund, European Regional Development Fund, and other targeted funds. Okay, <coughs> thank you. I think we're all waiting for details on the Shared Pr Prosperity Fund. Um, <coughs> can we, if I could move on to uh, to the, the, the next issue, um, you, you acknowledged earlier, um, Minister. Uh, the, the need to address gender equality. Um, now, COSLA stated in their submission, uh, and I quote, we believe that the document could benefit from more consideration of gender equality concerns and recognition of the distinct challenges faced by women and girls living on the islands. Uh, and you also mentioned um, the Young Islanders Network uh, in your opening remarks. Um, you may be aware that North Ayrshire Council they said that they wanted to see a specific reference to young people in island communities and their 
uh, human rights. Um, so, um, how will you respond to, to Cosla's view that gender equality should be high, uh, higher profile in the plan, and the other views that there should be more specific reference to young people in island communities? Well, I, I certainly on the latter point to start with, I mean, clearly I hope with the Young Islanders Network and the efforts we're now going to to make sure young people are, are and from, I uh, should stress, from, from primary age to, to young working people. So we're trying to pick up a, a wide range of young people, so not just those who are who are um, in the education system, those who have already moved through education into work and, and pick up a, a broad range. Um, we, we believe young people do feature strongly through the plan, but we, of course, will reflect if there are um, areas where people feel there should be a stronger presence for the role of young people in the plan. We will try and reflect that in the final plan. Uh, and uh, we, we believe they very much are central to several of the strategic objectives. Uh, but we do accept and recognise that gender equality could be more properly represented in the plan and that's one area Kavina, that we are keen to address in preparing the final plan so um, it is a proposed plan I want to stress that today so um, members can take heart from that and this sort of feedback is very welcome uh, and we, we, we are grateful to those who are raising these points because hopefully this is the important part of the process we can actually strengthen the plan make sure that it is, it is you know there's real buy-in from everybody when it's actually ultimately adopted okay good thanks Thank you, <coughs> Mr. We, we're going to start now looking at, at specific strategic ob objectives, uh, which may um, allow us all to focus on particular areas and particular answers. Um, so I think the first person up is the Deputy Convener, Maureen Watt. Maureen. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister and panel. Um, strategic objective one is to address population decline and ensure a healthy, balanced population profile. And I always think it's a bit of a conundrum, you know, saying that we need to retain our, our young people. I think our young people should have the opportunity, if they so wish, to get up and go and travel. But we need to make the, their home as attractive as possible uh, to come back to um, as when, when, when they w want to do so. And also to encourage inward migration and the um, example you gave of Alva was uh, really uh, quite interesting. So I wonder what it is that um, we need to do um, as a government and local authorities and other organisations to make our islands that attractive place to live and work. I mean, is it about digital connectivity? Is it about housing in terms of all types of tenure, whether it be um, you know, low-cost rented housing or indeed having plots of land um, to build your own house. And you, you talked about the importance of uh, culture uh, and tourism. Um, so, and, you know, does land tenure and land ownership play a part in all of this? So, um, what sort of connected community do we need to provide uh, in that, this type of plan? to make sure that we achieve the objectives, including this very strategic one to reverse population decline. I, th I think that that's probably, well, it is, because Islands has identified it as such, the most important question um, uh, around the most important objective is around the risk of depopulation. I, I very much accept, um, Deputy Commissioner, your, your, your points around the, um, we don't want to stifle people's ability to travel the world, learn from their travel and come back home, but we want them to have the ability to come back home. And that means providing the housing, the transport infrastructure, the digital connectivity, all the points that, that Maureen Mott has raised that are really important to those communities. But we also need to develop a bit of system thinking here and understand you know, that it's not a single measure that will have an impact. There are interactions between all these different things. So um, the investment has to happen in a way that understands, you know, what uh, combination of interventions will make uh, islands more attractive. And that's uh, all of the examples really interesting, as, as, as you say. Um, but we also want to learn, as, as Ms Harper was alluding to, from other examples where there have been successes, perhaps more modest ones, but very important uh, uh, progress that's been made elsewhere. There are obviously in the strategic objective um, some particular actions that have been identified uh, to identify islands where depopulation is becoming a critical issue in order to ensure these islands have their needs addressed. So that's effectively triaging where we have to, um, if there's particular challenges. During the consultation process, we had an approach from, from some islands who said they're actually worried they're going to be the next St Kilda. Uh, so that's pretty dramatic language, but it is actually a real threat that they face because they either have no young people or they've lost their young people uh, to, to the mainland. So how do we help those islands that are the most critical point in terms of their, their, their history that they may see a fundamental point as a tipping point where they 
start to lose essential services and other, other things because they cannot staff them anymore. Um, and then the other one, which is to understand the impact on Brexit, which we just discussed with Mr. Mr. McDonald. So that has an impact on, on population. That's not to be party political about it. It's just there is a, obviously an unknown here about what the implications will be for, for the ability to attract migrants to, uh, to our islands. Um, but uh, there are a lot of proposals that we have made and convener to uh, work with our partners to test approaches using small-scale pilots. This is something we, we introduced through the programme for government, and, and that could be across a number of the policy areas that uh, Maureen Watt mentions to try and see if, if, if these can help in triaging some of the problems at a local level. And we obviously want, uh, in terms of some of our, our more uh, significant areas of investment, such as transport and digital connectivity, to, to try and particularly target the, the, the remote and rural and island communities to try and help them. So you said in the previous um, answer that, or in your opening statement, that um, Finland and Croatia have islands plans. In this regard, probably Finland is more uh, akin to Scotland. So is there anything that we can learn from there where they've had islands that have faced the similar problems? What, what have they done to and, address and well, this? I, I, I'm going to have to start pushing you to be sure. as brief as possible because there are, th there are 13 objectives and there are members wanting yeah. to ask questions on all of them. And, and I know we won't get all the answers and I apologise, it's, it's, not, it's not by my choice. Yeah. But I'm going to have to push you as, as, no, no as much what, as I what may offer, Camino, if, if it would be helpful, I'm conscious that Eric and Don have looked extensively at the experience in Finland, so we could perhaps write to committee with some lessons that have been learned from the approach in, in Finland, which I agree is, 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 is relevant here. Uh, and I mean, if you uh, want to give a short example, by all means. Well, certainly, I, I am uh, fortunate enough to attend the Arctic Circle Assembly recently and heard from uh, one of the colleagues from Finland uh, who was uh, uh, actually there uh, with knowledge of Sweden and, and Finland from the, uh, the Aland Islands, which sit between the two countries. And there's been a specific approach there, which I, I find particularly interesting around how they've uh, attracted uh, population growth in particular communities. So taking a, uh, an approach uh, effectively um, is similar to the, the, the work we're doing uh, in some respects in the, the charter that's newly been signed between the West Niles uh, and, and Skills Development Scotland to try and provide targeted uh, approaches to attracting and retaining young people. Um, who are doing apprenticeships uh, in, in Ireland. So it's a very much a focused effort to try and uh, almost um, broker people coming into the community. And, and that was particularly interesting to me. But I'm conscious that Erica and Don are probably much more knowledgeable and we'll make sure we get you better examples, uh, convener, uh, for, for, for members to, to, to see where there have been learning points from experience elsewhere in Europe. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Peter, you've got them. Yes, uh, Minister, uh, the strategic objective too is to improve and promote sustainable economic development, and there's no doubt this is an, a, an appropriate priority. The concept of policy delivery as close to home as possible came through in many contributions. So with that in mind, what powers do you have to ensure government and local authority jobs cannot be removed from the islands? And is there an argument for some protected categories of jobs to allow for long-term planning? It, well, that's a, that's a, a very interesting question. I mean, I um, I think the challenge that we have is obviously local authorities themselves are autonomous uh, bodies. They're responsible for managing their own day-to-day -day, uh, uh, business, including all employment matters. And um, Scottish government has no direct kind of uh, locus in terms of influencing that. But I do know from discussions that have happened at Convention of Highlands and Islands, uh, just the most recent meeting, and the details of that will be online for for members to peruse. Um, that this sort of issue came up in regards to civil service relocation um, uh, as, and the principle uh, being established there that you know, where new, new civil service functions um, are developed for whatever reason if powers are devolved to Scottish Parliament or, or where we're creating new agencies and so forth that we should look to see how we can devolve or, or sorry, relocate um, those positions to uh, both the Highland, Highlands and Islands, so not just the, the Islands areas themselves, but also the rest of the Highlands and Islands. And that's something that you know, we're supportive of in principle. Um, so I think, that if anything, the, the, uh, the local authorities themselves are keen to get more um, uh, functions and jobs to, to the islands. And I don't see any immediate threat, but it's an issue that, unfortunately, we don't have a direct say in because uh, these are obviously autonomous local authorities that make their own decisions. Yeah, that's fine. One of the big issues we had with the bill, the islands bill, was there was no money attached to it. You have lots of aspiration, but to allow things to happen, we need, we need money. And South Harris Community Council suggested the formulation of an island fund. 
which could be accessed directly by local communities. Do you think this is viable, and is this something that's likely to happen? Um, I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's, it's, it's perhaps early. I'm aware of the South Irish Community Council's suggestion um, uh, through, other, through other means, and, and um, we will uh, certainly commit to scoping the proposal. It's too early to say yet you know, where, we can, where we can take it. We will consider uh, whether it's, uh, it's viable as, a, as an approach and work with um, our partners to develop uh, the implementation strategy. That's one of the things we can take forward and consider if that's a potential uh, route to um, delivering on some of the actions that are in the plan. Uh, so I can't give a commitment now. We obviously have to establish, you know, would it work as a mechanism, uh, but I can certainly commit that we're going to have a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Minister uh, Colin, it was uh, next question. Thank you very much, um, convener. Um, can I turn to the, the issue of, 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 um, of, of transport? Um, ferries are obviously high profile in the plan, and, uh, and I'll come to that in a minute, but the vast majority of journeys that take place are obviously within the islands themselves, and use locality partnership and their submissions say there is nothing in the commitments on connectivity within the island. So how do you respond to the, the evidence we've received that the plan says little about sustainable or active travel, and, and in fact there's very little mention of buses in particular? Well, um, that, that's a, a, a key issue. As I s I've been responding, I think transport, digital connectivity, housing are probably three key areas where we know there will be an impact on Ireland's quality of life and ability to um, address objective one, which is the depopulation issue. So the, the plan does recognise that transport, whether that's by air, road, ferry, um, bus, uh, active travel, mainland, uh, rail, when people get to the mainland, is hugely important for island communities. I very much want to acknowledge that. It's a key factor in uh, the ability of islanders to access services, particularly in areas such as health, which I know Mr Mountain has raised an issue or once or twice at FMQs about these sort of matters, as is, uh, members representing the islands themselves. Um, respondents to the consultation told us that um, they face many different challenges, um, and not least areas such as, as bus, which um, Mr Smith has, has, has raised. So the, the objective three of the plan um, sets out to improve transport services and uh, re repeatedly refers to transport links within an island being essential to allow island community to, to be mobile on the island. And this includes the current bus services and timetables, which we focused on more thoroughly through the implementation strategy. So I, I want to give a commitment to Mr Smith. This is an area that we're conscious of, that we need to, to reflect. I don't know whether um, uh, my colleague Heather Cowan wants to add anything to that. Uh, we may be short of time, but if, if possible, we could perhaps write uh, in any response to the committee with further detail of how we'll take forward the inter-island transport issues that Mr Smith raises. Cool. I think that would certainly be helpful because I think there is a gap there around the implementation, effectively, how you actually improve um, the connectivity within the islands. I think there's, there's, there's an overall objective, but there's certainly no detail as to how that will be improved. We just passed a transport bill in Parliament, but no proposals at all as to how that bill um, can benefit at all um, the island communities. I think it would be very helpful to know that. For me, just add briefly, just of course, these are issues that the National Transport Strategy will also address, convener. So I would hope some of the issues that Mr Smith quite rightly is raising would be picked up through that process. It's interesting that the actual document doesn't refer to the National Transport Strategy at all. So it says it, it should be aligned to a number of plans, but didn't actually list that, I think, on the, on the list. Um, but, uh, I, I take on board what the Minister says. Can, can I come to ferries, um, which again has come up in a, a lot of, of submissions, um, uh, we've had a lot of evidence on that, and the majority of these relate to, to two issues around cost uh, and, and capacity, now, notwithstanding the more immediate issues around procurement, which we, we've seen again uh, in the news in the last couple of days about the impact in one particular ferry, but how can you reassure this committee that the plan and uh, and those with which it's meant to align will, will see the concerns that people have over ferry services to, to and from the islands and in between the islands? Well, uh, clearly there are um, some areas in the Strategic Objective 3 which specifically make reference to um, uh, feedback uh, from the NTS, but also specific measures outlined around ferry services themselves. Uh, for the interest of time, I'll not go through them all, Convener, but they are listed under Objective Strategic Objective 3. But I do recognise the point Mr Smith raises. Uh, reliability clearly is important. Ferry capacity um, is uh, clearly important, particularly in areas such as uh, car capacity, uh, car deck capacity and, and the ability to carry freight, which we, I recognise is a, 
uh, is potentially a constraint on economic development in our island, so we need to get that right. And that will very much be at the heart of the development of the, the new ferries plan uh, and the vessel replacement and deployment plan uh, to ensure that we've got the right mix of vessels and the right type of vessels um, to, to meet uh, the needs of, of our island communities going forward. But obviously, we're, we're working, in some cases, we're in partnership with um, private sector as well, uh, such as um, Western Ferries, Pentland Ferries, others, to, to deliver services to um, our island communities. So it's not just about the supported ferries, of course, but, but we want to make sure we get this right. So I, I want to give an assurance to Mr Smith and the whole committee that uh, very much recognise, as Ferries Minister, the importance of ferries to uh, delivery of the island's plan. Just a quick follow-up to that before I move on to the next question is, when can the, uh, the, the committee expect to see the ferries plan? Um, I, I will get back to uh, your convener on that. I mean, the, the work is, is un well underway. Um, I am anticipating that I have not yet seen the, the draft, so it will depend on uh, what's in that, whether further work needs to be done, but uh, it's, it's well underway. Uh, so, but just a quick indication, before or after Christmas? Well, the, uh, the, the, there's obviously a consultation process to go through. So it depends what you mean, Kavina. If you mean the finalised plan, which she needs to take on from 2022 onwards, um, we're not at that point in the process yet. But we are uh, you know, going through the consultation steps to develop there, and so working with um, the stakeholders to develop the plan. So there, maybe, maybe there are you drafts could, of Maybe the plan. you could write to the committee will, and let us know. We'll give you a timetable time for the process, because there are a number of stages in the process that you may want Thank to be you. aware of. Next question is from Richard Lyle. Richard. Uh, Minister, a resident from Mull submitted the following example to the committee. I live in the settlement of eight homes. Two are lived in, three are short-term lets, two are setting homes, one is used three or four weeks a year maximum. Is the Minister confident the proposals in this plan can remedy the kind of example the committee has heard? Should islands be a housing pressure zone, i.e. houses can only be sold to residents to live in, not holiday homes? And do you agree as I would, as I do, if people want to live in an island, then buy a caravan. Um, Mr Lyle might get me in really hot water and answering some of these questions. How are you going to answer that? <laughs> Maybe if I talk um, for 30 seconds, it might give you an idea. <laughs> I, Minister. <laughs> they have a holiday home in an island, buy a caravan. Well, certainly that, that, that is a solution to having um, the ability to stay on our wonderful islands. I, I very much recognise that. Um, I, I suppose there's a number of issues in, in the point that Mr Lyle raises on behalf of communities like Mull, uh, and I think these are, there are important ones. Uh, we clearly are aware, uh, Scotland-wide, there are implications of the development of the second, uh, the sort of the uh, letting, short-term letting market, and including the um, uh, planning, uh, planning Act, uh, that's just uh, Planning Scotland Act 2019 enables local authorities to uh, designate control areas for short-term lets uh, where planning permission will always be required if owners want to change use of their property to a short-term let. And that's identified as one measure by which there could be some control provided to the growth in the uh, uh, second homes and, 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 and short-term letting market, which is maybe having an impact in some communities in, in, uh, in, in damaging their ability to retain young people uh, in, in an area. Housing crisis basically on our islands. The fact that people are houses that people want to live in, the young people want, you know, people, are, young people are leaving the islands because they can't buy a home on their own island, because all those island houses are being, with the greatest respect, are being let out or are being sold to people who go there a couple of weeks. I don't, I don't disagree that people should go to an island, but if they want to go to have a wee holiday in an island, well, take your caravan with you. That may cause problems too. But, <laughs> but basically, the situation is there are problems, there are, there, are, there are housing problems on islands, and the only way we're going to solve it is to, is to look at the problem to solve it. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with Mr Lyle that there's a serious problem in some of our communities. Uh, I used to live in a small village on the mainland uh, where uh, over half the houses were second homes, so I know exactly um, the implication to have uh, 45 homes and less than 40 residents in the community. Uh, with, uh, we had the only child uh, under the age of five in the community at one point. And uh, so there, there are, yes, I, th I think it's very much can be part of the problem and we do need to address it. I think, I know there's some disagreement in Parliament around the approach that should be taken on this, um, but the Planning Scotland Act does provide a tool now 
for local authorities that identify that there are in their community that there are communities that are affected by this issue to take steps to try and bring some control to it and I hope that is a, an intervention which will, will help um, I, we perhaps uh, could be know if it would be helpful we can outline in a letter to the committee some of the areas where we are investing in housing to try and address the issue that Mr Lyle raises which might be helpful to Parliament's scrutiny of the, the island's plan Richard, Richard did you have a, a, a follow-up on okay, okay. Um, Angus, I think you have the next question. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. Uh, if I could turn to the issue of uh, digital connectivity. Um, now, clearly, we, we've discussed this issue when you uh, last appeared before the committee. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say that there is uh, recognition in the responses to the committee that the rollout of digital connectivity has been strong in the past years. Um, but there's obviously still issues for certain communities uh, and also in relation to access to 4G networks. So uh, how um, will this plan ensure that those most remote in, in our islands will have access to the same broadband facilities as is best practice elsewhere on the islands? And how can the plan drive the spread of 4G access? Well, I think um, to keep my comments brief, Convener, what I would say is I very much agree with what Mr Macdonald is saying and what the, 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 the uh, respondents to the, the plan a consultation I've said. Um, strategic objective six in the proposed plan sets out a number of commitments to help us ensure that the plan is fair, inclusive, uh, and including commitment to deliver a step change in the quality of broadband services available across the island. That then has the consequence of providing the backhaul that allows the mobile connectivity to improve as well. Uh, and as I've seen uh, yesterday, albeit not on an island, the 4G Info programme is now beginning to deliver mass in, in some locations so the first three are, are under development, and I hope we'll see some in, in the islands shortly. Uh, but the programme for government also announced will establish the Scotland 5G Centre, uh, and this to pick up the mobile connectivity issue that uh, Mr Manolan raises. And although that's being led by Glasgow and Strathclyde universities, I'm very keen, and I've, I think I said this at the committee session the other week, um, that University of Highlands and Islands uh, are, are also engaged closely in that process. And hopefully we can learn how to develop um, uh, examples and case studies of how the technology can actually particularly aid island communities and rural communities and build the demand for the services, which will then help follow through into, into commercial investment. So I'm uh, happy if, if it's helpful. I know I'm going to be probably coming back to the committee to talk about R100 and digital connectivity. can maybe expand on that theme when, I, when I'm next year. No, no doubt when the, the uh, North contract preferred bidder is announced in, so in due course, that, Minister. Uh, <laughs> um, Emma, I think you've got the next question. Yeah, it's uh, related to health and social care. I know we have challenges as Deputy Convener of the Health Committee. We're always talking about uh, rural health care delivery and, and then, of course, Ireland is part of that. So I'm interested in how, as part of the plan, do we look at um, helping people age well? You know, we've got an ageing population, but we want them to age well. So as part of the plan, we need to look at attracting and retaining staff as well. So... Um, Basically, just a, a, a quick update on how does the plan uh, help to address health and social care? Oh, well, I think, I think um, you know, it would be fair to say this is hugely significant, um, not least because in some of the discussions at COHE and uh, with, with the island's uh, uh, strategic group that I uh, chair, this has been raised an issue about re attracting, retaining staff in health, uh, health provision in the islands has, has obviously historically been a difficult issue. But throughout the plan, we do recognise the changing nature of care itself and um, the increasing complexity of, of uh, patients' needs are just some of the challenges that now must be met um, to ensure fair, accessible health care for those on islands. And that said, uh, many respondents have told us, as they've clearly telling the committee, um, uh, of the strengths on their island health care provision, including the building of new hospitals and uh, some of the measures taken to provide a personalised service given by community GPs. Um, but we do know that um, for some islanders, such services can be very limited. Um, we're talking about, obviously, recognising in response to Mr Green, the diversity of our islands and the context. So there are hugely different scenarios in some islands where there, there's no localised health care. They have to go to mainland or other islands to, to receive health care. And, of course, Rigmore in Inverness provides uh, some specialist functions for, for all of the Highlands islands. So we know that... Um, 
the population demographic in many of Scotland's islands is shifting to could a much larger percentage of older residents, which is which is great because uh, obviously people are living longer and hopefully having healthy lives. But it does raise some new challenges in terms of shaping and remodelling healthcare to provide for that uh, slightly older um, age profile. Uh, so that's why in Strategic Objective 7 we set out to improve and promote health and wellbeing by working with um, partners to ensure there's fair and accessible health and social care for those who need it and we'll also identify good practice, which I think um, Ms Harper is uh, alluding to, uh, uh, and work with others to develop a plan to support uh, ageing population islands. That's another area where um, the team uh, approach led by um, uh, Fiona Hislop will also help inform what we do uh, to help particular island and remote rural communities as well. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the next question is from John Finney. John. Um, a couple of questions, uh, Minister, on Strategic Objective 8 to improve uh, environmental wellbeing and deal with biosecurity. If I can quickly quote from uh, Community Land Trust's Outer Hebrides, uh, the plan seeks to be green as, under, as an underpinning principle, and this would seem to align with the Scottish Government's renewed focus on climate change issues. Shite, um, so, oh, site, beg your pardon, site. <laughs> 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 I'm sure the official record has already been corrected. Sorry, John. I, I do beg your pardon. Yes. <laughs> Sight should not be lost if the place based approach and the desire to move forward with renewables and sustainable land management. Um, place based approach, I'm, I'm sure we could discuss that at great length. I suggest we don't. But could you comment on that, Minister, please? Well, I, I, th I think um, that, that is an important theme. Happy to, to expand on that a future opportunity. Uh, I think place-based thinking is certainly now uh, being run through all sorts of government uh, policy making, and, and clearly uh, this is a very good example. Islands Act and the, the National Islands Plan is a, a very good manifestation of that. I hope. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, as, as Mr. Finney has alluded to, there are some specific, uh, and this touches on the point that Ms. Harper was making earlier on. There are also uh, opportunities to learn from where. Uh, taking a place-based approach has already happened, maybe less formally in the past, but we've now got some very good system thinking that has fed to into good projects in islands that we can learn from to replicate elsewhere in the islands, uh, but also to, to actually replicate on the mainland too. So I think um, the islands are a font of innovation in, in many areas of, of, of life, including in the energy sector in particular. And there's some really good examples of environmental management in islands as well, which uh, I think we can learn from too. Okay, thank you. If I can touch on a uh, biosecurity, uh, Minister, um, and and the view that, uh, that that it's light in content and detail compared to elsewhere, and uh, non-invasive species are one of the key drivers of decline in natural uh, diversity, and that was in the State of Nature report 2019, and the islands are particularly affected by this. Um, they hold a disproportionate amount of uh, our wildlife, given their size. Uh, for instance, three quarters of seabirds in the UK are found there. Can you outline what you will, um, the measures you'll take to deliver a more explicit definition of enhanced biosecurity, please? Well, that, that particular final point, I think, um, would be one area we can direct the partnership group to have a look at. Um, so to, to uh, take on board the, the learning the local authorities themselves have got in terms of, in many cases, managing environmental issues and working with stakeholders to manage invasive non-native species with SNH's input and other, other agencies. So I would hope that we can use that partnership process to refine what we mean by uh, those, those commitments and also to help identify how we're going to measure progress against them. There have been some amazing successes. I think the Shant Islands, uh, RSPB, have done some fantastic work there uh, to, through predator control to, to eliminate uh, threats to seabirds and seen a, a, a remarkable rebound in the population of seabirds on the Shant Islands. And that's something you know we can learn from because um, you're quite right, Mr Finney. Um, we've got some of the, the best natural capital in the world in, in our island communities and if obviously invasive non-native species, uh, species threaten that, then that's, that's clearly something we, we, we need to, to tackle head on um, and hopefully the partnership group can help inform how best we can work together to achieve that. Thank you, Minister. Colin. <laughs> on on um, John Finney's line of question. Given that the government have declared a climate emergency since um, we passed the Islands Bill, do you think that the plan as it stands goes far enough to recognise this? I mean, I think as John Finney's touched on, there's, there's no real mention of the restoration and protection of, of island ecosystems, which is clearly crucial um, when it comes to, um, to, to mitigating the effects of, of climate change. Well, I, 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 we can obviously pick up the point. If we are not making the point strongly enough, then we can reflect that in the final version. I, I certainly would want to flag up that we're very aware that, that some island communities face a particular challenge in terms of climate adaptation. 
Um, they're uh, obviously uh, the most obvious point about rising sea levels, coastal erosion, some of these issues, but we're also seeing um, uh, impacts in terms of um, uh, migration of species, the impacts on fisheries, the impact on uh, the economy of, of the islands from climate change. And, and so we need to look at how we can help communities adapt to change in the climate, but also our, our island communities have got a potentially a hugely significant role to play in helping mitigate the effects of climate change through areas such as renewable energy. And there was very strong interest in, in those consultation exercises from communities about their opportunities to exploit uh, renewables in areas, not just the obvious ones such as wind, uh, wave and tidal power, but also in areas such as developing hydrogen. Uh, we see very good evidence of, of work being done in Orkney on that, but other islands are interested in that too. And so we, if, if, if the committee feels it's necessary to strengthen that, I'm more than happy to look at how we can do that now that we've got certainty around the climate change uh, act uh, as it's now received royal assent and of course the work that's ongoing on the climate change plan now uh, has already kicked in so we can maybe see if there's anything further we can enhance the the, the national islands plan to take on board those points thank you minister uh, jamie green jamie you've got the next one uh, thank you convener uh, talking about education uh, which i think is strategic objective at 12 um on page 58 of the plan for the benefit of those with a copy in front of them. Can I point the Minister to Objective 3 uh, on the list of, there of uh, seven? Ensure that young people are given the same opportunities to access education as young people <coughs> on mainland Scotland. Certainly an ambition that I'm sure we all share, um, but can you just elaborate a little bit on how you will ensure that young people on islands will have parity of access to education as those on the mainland? Well, in, it, I think this comes back to um, understanding the context. Clearly, there were some communities where they already have both primary, secondary, and in some cases, tertiary education on the island. So, uh, good examples of that, I suppose, would be in Nile of Lewis and in, in, in Sky, um, other areas where they've got a range of opportunities. Clearly, the other islands where there is no school presence at all, um, uh, young pupils have to perhaps have residential um, uh, access to education on, on the mainland or on other islands, and that that can be. Uh, hugely significant in terms of their development. Um, it may be necessary to give them social interaction and to to improve their educational outcomes. Um, so I don't profess to, to have all the answers to, to that point yet, because I appreciate it will be a very challenging aspiration to meet. I think the Young Islanders Network will, will clearly have a very important role engaging with primary, secondary and indeed tertiary education uh, students to sort of understand you know, uh, the nature of the experience, is it actually one that they're, they're happy with? Is it one that they feel that there needs to be uh, firm action to address? And to understand the kind of impacts of, of people having to, to travel, in some cases, stay off the island in order to undertake their education. What does that, how does that affect them? How does that affect their families? And make sure that we're doing everything we can to avoid any negative impacts uh, on, on families and, and children um, in those situations. So I don't profess to have the answers, Convener, but um, again, I, I'm sure that's an area that as the, the implementation strategy develops, we'll start to have some clarity about um, where we can most likely expect to see progress. Uh, obviously, in a tough financial climate, it's not possible to address every need, but it's certainly an aspiration we want to try and deliver on if we can. So just to clarify, I mean, this, this goes back to the point Mr. Rumble's made. This is supposed to be the plan to meet these objectives, and you, you've made a commitment in this plan, again, it's a draft, but if it's still there in the final draft, to ensure that young people on islands have the same access to education as those on mainland. And, and my point is, whilst there is an aspiration, is it is it practically possible to even deliver on that commitment? be options. I mean, uh, we've talked already about, um, you know, Finland, one area perhaps where we can look at is how have they addressed this issue in terms of their islanders. They have a very well-developed um, learning platform where they've got distributed kind of learning. Uh, UHI is, I suppose, is the closest example we've got in Scotland to that. Um, but, you know, at primary and secondary level, they, 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 they do this as well, I think, as I understand it. So there may be ways in which we can use technology to help improve accessibility. Obviously, there are aspects of education that you can't necessarily replicate through digital means, such as social interaction, the need to socialise with our children. Um, so, you know, there are limits to where you would want to sort of have, you know, a single pupil sort of dialing into to every every class, um, the imp implications for them as an individual might not be uh, as great as we think. So we need to have a balance, but certainly there are, there are the investment in digital connectivity may well en enable some options 
uh, to be progressed that haven't been possible previously and so we need to explore that with our local authority partners and see what they think we could do more to help their communities deliver education and, uh, and engage with their colleagues in the education portfolio to see what we can do to address that. So I appreciate it's not there in the plan at present. Uh, I'm not proposing we take that commitment out uh, just to address the point Mr Green makes. It's more a case of how we can actually flesh that out and actually see how we can deliver against it. I think you've answered my question on digital and, and use of technology, so I won't press that further. But that's obviously young people. What about adult and, uh, education? There's very little mention of that in your objectives here. Um, what work will be done to ensure that adults in islands are, have access to ongoing education, retraining, skills development uh, throughout the course of their lifespan? I, I, I hopefully will be brief, uh, convener. Um, we can certainly reassure the committee that adult education will have uh, more prominence in the final version of the plan, so we take that one on the chin. Um, recognise education islands doesn't um, just stop at secondary school, and islanders should have access to options for further education, skills, training, apprenticeships, and so forth. And we'll give more attention to lifelong learning opportunities in the plan. So it's a, it's a, a final plan. So it's a fair point, Mr. Green raises, and we'll hopefully strengthen that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the final uh, question goes to Peter Chapman. Peter. Thank you. Uh, Minister, this, the final strategic objective 13 is to support effective implementation of the National Islands Plan. Does it not seem strange to you, that, because it certainly seems strange to me, that implementation is a specific strategic objective? I, I appreciate that. can look a bit um, unusual. Um, uh, but we wanted, I think, two things to happen here. One, to give it sufficient weight in the document itself to draw out, emphasise the importance of implementation uh, in the way we've been discussing today and how strategically uh, crucial it is ensuring the plan is properly implemented um, and uh, to make sure that the, the over 100 actions that are in the plan um, are actually delivered. Uh, but also, I think it says something about, I suppose, the culture of the approach we need to take. Um, so it's actually formalising, if you like, reference to the fact we're going to need collaborative working, we're going to need to, to recognise some of the criticism that's been there today perhaps about not recognising the role of local authorities explicitly enough. So we're actually making a virtue of the fact we're going to be working with a range of partners, specifically local authorities and other island stakeholders, to, imp to develop the implementation strategy. So they will have a voice in how we deliver on this. And all the issues that flow from that in terms of funding that colleagues have raised and and how we uh, measure progress in terms of the metrics and indicators flow from that. So I think it's, um, it's giving its, a, its place in the plan as a specific objective in itself. Uh, I appreciate the, the point Mr. Uh, Mr Chapman is making, but hopefully it, it just means it gets the attention it deserves, because it's going to be critical to delivery, and um, we need to kind of, kind of a partnership culture that, that, that will then help deliver on the actions. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Thank you, Minister. Before we actually finish the session, I've got two things I'd like to do. One, uh, just Angus, you wanted to bring something to the attention of the committee. Yes, yeah, thanks, Commissioner. I failed earlier to uh, refer members to my register of interest. Uh, I have a non-domestic property in the Western Isles. Perfect. Um, and the only other thing to say is that uh, during this brief session, there's been a lot of questions thrown up. Um, we have answers to some of them. Some of them will have to be reflected where we don't have answers in our response to you. So thank you for... for uh, doing what you could to answer the question. I would normally suspend the meeting to allow you to depart, but <laughs> we are quite pushed for time, so I may ask you, Minister, thank if you. you and your panel uh, could depart quietly, and I'd like to thank you and all of your panel for, uh, for attending the meeting today. From the committee's point of view, I'd like to move on to Agenda Item 3, which is European Union Withdrawal Act. Uh, we have received consent notification into, in relation to one UK SI, as detailed on the agenda. This instrument is being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Members may wish to, to note that the date actually for laying at Westminster has moved from the 28th of November, as set out in the paper before us, to the 17th of February 2020. Um, I wondered if anyone had any comments in relation to this. Uh, Mr. Rumbles. Considering that it's considering that it's moved to, the, to February, I repeat what I was saying last time, and I hope that the Scottish Government will take this on board. Why are we being sent these when everything may change on December the 12th and these may not be necessary? OK. Um, uh, Stuart, I think you wanted to comment. Um, well, I recognise uh, why Mr Rumble says what he does. A general principle in managing time is do something when the opportunity first exists 
because you never get the time back and the time that we might use in future for something like this might well be needed for something about which we do not currently know. I think this should be done as quickly as we reasonably can without distorting other things that we do. Okay. Um, Mr. Finney, John. Yeah, no, uh, we had this discussion previously and it certainly would be uh, very wrong for anyone to seek to represent as passing, doing due process here as being supportive, well, certainly on my part, being supportive of the UK exiting the EU. I'm not. However, this is part of our business process and I think we should proceed with it. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any? Uh, I think that the point, therefore, it is part of a procedural uh, requirement for this Parliament. So it appears that the majority of the committee would like to move forward with this. So I really want to ask the question, does the committee agree to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for the consent of the UK SI referred to in the notification as given? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore uh, would like to move the committee into private session. Before we actually close, can I just say you've got five minutes committee uh, before we go on, So, but the meeting now moves into private session. Thank you. <laughs>